in, but I, partially because of my parents, because I had fought so hard to get to this place and I had, I had to prove to everybody that what I wanted was really worthy of what I'm putting into it. And it was, I was, it was gonna make it work. I was gonna make it work, right? And, and I loved him. I loved him, right? So I think I really wanted to be with him. I wanted it to all work out. Um, and I, I convinced myself that if I just made the changes, that it would. So what are the name of these shoes? <laughs> these are my Tim's. Um, and they have so many stories to them. <laughs> these, these, these shoes. Uh, I've had them for since I was 15. Um, do you want to hear the story? Of course. Just go with it. Yeah, um, of course. So they were actually um, <clears throat> bought by a guy I was seeing at the time as a gift um, uh, and I kept them like I've just kept them since that like since I was 15 and um, and they I don't I don't I don't wear them a great deal but when I do wear them you know they just kind of like take me back to nostalgia of like my my high school days of like you know the big jeans and the the big hoop earrings and the and the Tims and you know just the big t-shirts and all of it the whole look so that is what I brought to clean today because I am not a sneakerhead. I don't have any sneakers. I, I don't even really like, when you said clean my shoes, I'm like, I don't really do that. <laughs> now, now I feel like I need to work it into my routine though. Like you've kind of made me a little judgmental of myself and this probably like, well, is that a thing? Like is everybody cleaning their shoes and I'm just not like. <laughs> so, so that's where I am in the cleaning of the shoes situation. Okay. And the shoelaces, though, are not 15 years old because one day I came home and uh, I have children and they're grown boys. But they, they tend to do weird things like take shoelaces off of my shoes. And I, I, I found that my shoelaces were missing and nobody would claim that they lost, that they took the shoelaces. So I had to just go and buy new shoelaces. It was like the most ridiculous situation. <laughs> Why are these shoes 15 years old? Um, why are they 15 years old? Mm -hmm. um, like, why did I keep them for 15 years? Yes. So, well, <laughs> I don't wear them as often, so they lasted 15 years. Mm -hmm. And then um, they are, like, they're in good condition for 15 years, right? Like, they're comfortable. They are great for hiking. So when I go hiking, I wear them. Um, and I feel like they're timeless, right? Like, I had lots. I used to work at Baker's Shoe Store, so I was a shoe person in high school. And, um, and like, most of those shoes have... have have uh, have lived their life of fashion, and I did not maintain them or keep them, and and they didn't last for certain. But uh, my Tims have lasted to 15 years. And it's a good color. It's a good color. Right? Definitely a good color. I saw they have some new Tims designs out recently. Mm. Like I saw that. But How do you feel about the new Tims designs compared to the old designs? It feels like new Tims design. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like the classics the same way. It yeah. does something like it just doesn't hit the same way. Yeah. Um, and then I feel like there's always that thing of like, there was like a, a period of wearing them or like it was just, it was part of the culture of everything, right? Mm -hmm. So like it's kind of like repurposing culture maybe? Yeah. I don't know, something about it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Material-wise, could you tell the difference between new Tims and old Tims from a material standpoint? I could not. I could not. <laughs> I, I don't have that kind of knowledge of, of, of Tims. <laughs> full, full, full honesty. So what does it mean to walk a day in your shoes? 
Mm. What does it mean to walk a day in my shoes? I've had an interesting day, so today would be a day to ask me that. Um, I think to walk a day in my shoes would be to have a lot of thick skin around just daily interaction and experiences with people whom are close to me or somehow connected to me and navigating that. Um, I kind of say it is almost like I think I'm constantly cultivating in chaos. Um, and, and, and it's not always chaos. Like there's beauty, there's joy, there's lots of good things. But I think that in the back of my mind, I'm constantly always waiting for another shoe to drop. <laughs> no pun intended, right? Um, <clears throat> so it, yeah, it, it's a lot of um, it's a lot of navigating and um, and trying to find a balance between being present for myself and giving to all the people around me, whether it's in work, whether it's in family, whether it's in relationships, all of it. How much work does that take? Hmm. Depending on the day, it's different, but I think it's um. It's like a, it, it's a lot of mental um, balancing and awareness. It's more awareness than balancing, I think, right? Like it's a lot of mental awareness and I have to be acutely, acutely aware of first, my own body, my own body's reactions, what is sitting with me and how it's sitting with me, like whether I'm comfortable in that moment or I'm like feeling threatened in some way in that moment or I'm feeling my ego come out in that moment whatever it is right and then it's like that additional element of but it doesn't stop there right it's like then I have to gauge well what about the people around me what are they feeling and where is it coming from and like I go through a, a gamut of internal questions when I'm interacting with people so even though I'm listening to them and I'm having a conversation with them I'm also gauging so much that's not said um and that's a lot that's that is a lot like you know i don't think anybody's ever asked me how much does that have to, like how hard is that right like it's um yeah it's i don't think my mind rests because of it you know because you're you're constantly thinking you're constantly analyzing you're constantly taking in it's like a it's like a computer like a data computer and i'm just always always taking in data around me. Um, and I think we all are. So I don't know, I don't think it's necessarily <laughs> um, just me, but for me to understand that about myself has helped me to find my center and grounding in hard times and moments where I'm being pushed and uh, tried in life. Would you say you were raised this way or you figured things out as you grew up? I figured it out as I was Definitely. Um, I was raised to acquiesce. I was raised to kind of um, uh, like a balance between just do what you're told and have your own thoughts. <laughs> and I feel like the do what you told seemed to take more precedence when my thoughts were not aligning with what everybody else wanted. So if it was like speaking out in the same things that other people were speaking out, then it was approved. But if it was speaking out on things that were counter to, and I grew up in a very religious Muslim family, so a lot of it was sometimes counter to religion or counter to culture or counter to norms and messages I was given. Um, and that, that was not the kind of speaking I'm supposed to do. It was more so that I was really, you know, I was supposed to follow the rules. Um, and that was important to my family. 
but I was not a very good girl follower. I've never been a girl follower. <laughs> Never been a good girl follower. It's a rule spiels. I well, I, it's so funny because even now I have a conversation with my children, and we say this thing where, like, um, I'll say um, that rules are meant to be um, critically examined because I think they just are. They're meant to be critically examined, um, and. That is, um, so, yeah, I'm not a, not a rule follower. <laughs> and, and I think, like, I, I very early questioned rules that were around me that didn't make sense, right? So, like, a lot of it is, it's that critical examination of, like, but that doesn't really make sense, right? So, why would I be doing that? Um, and... You know, I think, um, who's that rule for? Like, who's that really about? Um, and it didn't feel like it fit me, or it fit what I was doing, um, or what I, I internally believed to be right, you know? So, yeah. Pain to power. Yeah, pain to power. What does that title mean to you? Oh, it means everything. Um, it it is so. It really was born out of um, my own journey of finding my power and my pain. And I don't think at the moment I thought that that's what it was. I didn't know that that's what I was doing. But I think that's what my journey has been. Right? You asked me how have I come to this place, right? How have I understood this much about myself and been able to know myself so well and my self-awareness? And, um, and it came really more so because life experiences pushed me to have to um, take moments of pain and figure out how to move through them, right? And to me, that is pain to power. Um, so, that's been my journey, right? And then, um, you know, as I, as I have, and I think for me, okay, so if I were to like break it down, right? My pain to power journey really, really started at, in college. <clears throat> um, I was a junior in college and um, my, I, was seeing this guy, which I think at this point would be defined as a situationship. And, um, and I got pregnant. <clears throat> I got pregnant. He was my boss. I was working part-time in a bank, and he was my boss, and he was eight years older than me, and he seemingly was this very mature person. He owned a, he owned a condo, so I felt like, okay, you're ahead of the game, <laughs> most of the people that I see and, and dating, right? And uh, I really, really liked him. I really liked him. I really thought he was a good person. I thought we matched well. And, um, and I had stronger feelings for him. But then um, I got pregnant. And a situationship um, didn't seem to really last further than, uh, <clears throat> than, you know, not into pregnancy, right? So my pregnancy created a lot of challenges, particularly in which is that he, um, he did not. Uh, he did not want to be a part of it, um, so he kind of disappeared. So I had to. That was one piece of it, right? Like I was navigating this on my own. Um, but in addition, my pregnancy was complicated, and this was the pain to power journey. And because um, <clears throat> I got pregnant. Um, from in a conservative Muslim family, but I was not just a you know not just from a conservative Muslim family. I was from an entire community that my parents were the patriarchs and matriarchs of, and my brothers and brother and sister, both older, were known for their roles as Islamic Muslim leaders, and so me getting pregnant was a massive community conversation. It was a family conversation. It was a lot of things. And my parents 
um, went through their own iterations of handling it. Um, so when I got pregnant, I was one, battling the fact that, okay, so the guy that I got pregnant with is gone and doesn't care about me. So just as a 21-year-old college kid who never really dated that much, I was processing like the emotional of that, right? Like that like just, oh my God, my heart is broken, right? Like, but I was also like, and I'm supposed to be a mom, and then on top of it, my, my family was, was pushing back. Like, you know, originally, honestly, they, they didn't want me to keep it. it. I had to fight to carry my pregnancy to actual, like, having a child. And then I fought throughout to just not have to give him up for adoption, not have to be married off to do it. Like, I, like I was hidden at times from the community members that would come over. Like, I was, I was holding a lot as a kid, trying to figure out so much at the same time. So my pay into power journey was that starting point because for me, the thing that kept me in my power was that I, for the first time in my life, was responsible for someone else outside of myself. And I knew that and I think holding that was what got me through it all. And um, in the end, in the end, I had my son um, and I, graduated from college, I finished my schooling, I did all the things and I was successful and I now have four kids, right? Like, you know, but um, that was a huge test of everything in me to go from like this party college girl to like no worries whatsoever to literally like a week later I'm sitting in front of a pregnancy test trying to figure out what's the next steps in my life. Um, and it was a journey. It was a journey, and it started the journey with then my ex, who came back into the picture, and we got married. And that was then a whole other learning of what pain to power is for me, was my marriage. Do you mind if I ask you some questions about that before yeah. we get there? Family dynamic-wise, what does that change relationship-wise between you and your parents? Oh, um, so it was like a, like an iteration of, of changes and development and involvement. Um, I think in the starting points we started with um, just, we were coming at each other from heads and I think my, my parents really didn't agree with my decision and they struggled with it and they didn't think I was going to be capable of being a mother. They didn't think I was ready. Like all the things that I, I'm sure every parent really thinks about, right? Like I, I have children now who are grown men and I think about what are they capable of doing at this point, you know? And, um, and, and so that was complicated. Um, and then I think what started to happen was that I became closer to my father because my pregnancy kind of pushed me a little bit closer to religion that I had pulled away from because I need center and grounding. And that made my dad really like closer to me. And so my dad and I started to have a better relationship. My mom and I had a better relationship. And I think slowly I proved to them, one, that I took this seriously. And two, that I was gonna be capable of it. Um, and. There were a lot of things that happened that I had to keep proving myself through with not just them, but with the, you know, the father of my child at the time, right? Like, and everything. Um, and, but when he was born, I always think about, so I tell my children their birth stories on their birthdays, and his is like the best one, I think, because it was the best birth of a child. And it's funny because it was the only one that I did without a husband or another, a man present, and yet it was the best one. Almost probably because of that, now that I look back on it. Um, but it was like my entire family rallied around me. I had my aunts and cousins and nieces all in the, in the delivery room for like most of the time until like it was time to like be like, no, nobody else should be here, right? You know, and it was like I, I wasn't alone. And the second he was born, it was, everybody loved him. Loved him, loved him, loved him. And that was it. Like, he just had to come into this world and show everybody this is what I was fighting for. 
So that changed our relationship to that point. Um, but it took a lot of like iterations of different things to get there. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. So chapter two of the journey. Yeah. Hmm. He's back. He's back. Um, he made a couple of different appearances coming back, but I think the final one was when I thought he started to change. I don't really have anything else to do with fish. Is that okay? You can do the bottoms if you want. <laughs> so I'm new to shoe cleaning. I, <laughs> if you want, I have a brush that you could use for the bottom of the shoe if oh, that might work that better for you. That would probably be better because yeah. I wouldn't know what to do with this because I don't think this is the right brush. So you want me to just, I'm going to keep talking. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, that second chapter is just an interesting that big one. Brush right there. Oh, perfect. Thank you. No problem. Um, the second chapter is an interesting one because. Do you wet the brush? No. You could wet it if you'd like to, okay. just to make things move around easier. I think maybe I need to do it <coughs> first and then wet it. Um, but so, uh, um, he came back into my life when my son was three months old. Um, I could uh, see your cup of water, have a solution that I could oh. put in that cup in the meantime. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So he came back in his um, life when he was three years old? When he was three months old. Three months, um, okay. So he, he was there. Um, he was gone through the whole pregnancy. He wasn't there at the birth, but he was there in the three months. Um, and But at that three months, he, um, he, he came in and... Uh, and it's an interesting thing because um, he spoke to my father as though it was my father that went through everything, that my father did with everything, that my father had born the baby, like everything. Like he literally didn't even look at me. So disassociation. Um, absolutely. And, um, and this is what I appreciate about my father being um, who he is, uh, especially being a South Asian man. He's from Pakistan and you often don't hear about fathers in the South Asian community always supporting their daughters in things um, and uh, not supporting I think that's not that's not what I'm saying but I think there's a there's some some narratives around that right um, and I would say that my father was was in that moment and this is again you asked about my relationship with my parents right um, I knew he was on my side because he looked at him and he said, you have to understand something. Maria did all of this herself. Maria went through the pregnancy. Maria went to school. Maria got the job and worked while she was pregnant. Maria brought the baby into this world. Like Maria has been taking care of him. It, you don't need to say anything to me. Everything you need to say needs to be said to Maria. And, um, and it was, an, it was an interesting wake-up call because I don't think that uh, my ex was expecting that. And truthfully, <laughs> to this day, leveraging my parents and my family has been a thing in his ammo of controlling me. Um, and, uh, and so uh, he came back in and then he disappeared and then he came back at six months and then he disappeared and then he... <laughs> he uh, Finally, at about, um, I think it was uh, around nine months, when my son was nine months old, he came, it seemed like, for good. And it was, it was for good. Um, and he started to not just come, and I think this is again like indicative of what it was in terms of pain to power, right? Like, he would come, but he always kind of treated me like I didn't exist, like I wasn't there, like I wasn't a part of this process, like it wasn't my son, um, like I was just this conduit. <laughs> and, um, 
and and he didn't speak directly to me and he had so many parameters when he would visit his son I couldn't be in the room I couldn't be around him I couldn't I couldn't make eye contact with him I had to be somewhere else in the house like it was like it was so many parameters he tried to give me a car at one point and he said you get this car I have to give you a car so you can take my son back and forth to appointments but you can't go anywhere else with it except for school and work and to take my son place and I'm like the hell I gave him those keys back and I said I do not want your car <laughs> like I do not want anything from you and you know I'm saying it out loud and I just feel like it's a moment to talk about because again in this pain to power journey I think I started to finally find my power through the pregnancy and through standing up to him with all these ridiculous demands he had of me and then when I started to have feelings for him again, when my son was six months, and I started to imagine what it was like to have a whole family and have my son have his father in his life, I lost all my power. And I let what I thought was love guide me in all my decisions, and, um, and we got married. And we got married, um, and uh, very quickly in the marriage, he made it clear that there was a lot of resentment that he felt towards me. Um, and that I was gonna have to earn his love. Um, and so that was my, like that was second chapter. Second chapter was 17 years of that. Um, living with a lot of resentment that constantly would come up. And then, um, and then trying to earn someone's love because I loved him. I wanted to be a good wife. I wanted to have a happy home. I grew up in a happy home and I wanted all of that and I thought I could cultivate it and I thought I could help someone who was broken to want that for himself and for our home and for our lives. Um, so that was chapter two. How much of that is culture versus internally always always wanting to have a family. Mm. So, I don't know if it was culture as much of for me in many ways. <clears throat> I'm not a perfectionist, but I'm one of those people who follows through on things and who prides herself in the fact that when I start something, I finish it. Um, and I think that that was part of my motivation is that I was like, I fought so hard to get here. I fought hard to bring my son into the world. I fought hard to marry this person who, and I didn't say all the things, but he's Catholic, he's white and Vietnamese, like he wasn't anything like my family. He was very different from all the things that, you know, would have been uh, expected maybe of me to some extent, or, or not really though, my parents were always very open, so it wasn't like they expected me to marry anyone particularly, but they did want him to be Muslim, and he wasn't, right? He wasn't any of those things. Um, and, but, I, partially because of my parents, because I had fought so hard to get to this place, and I had, I had to prove to everybody that what I wanted was really worthy of what I'm putting into it, and it was, I was, it was going to make it work. I was gonna make it work, right? And and I loved him. I loved him, right? So I think I really wanted to be with him. I wanted it to all work out. Um, and I, I convinced myself that if I just made the changes, that it would, right? Like it was me that I needed to just make adjustments. And every time he would give me a suggestion and a point of what I needed to adjust, I would adjust it thinking that would make the change. And he would then love me and treat me kinder and be gentle with me and uh and he wasn't <laughs> but i th 
think culture's role in it for me is yes, there's an expectation not to divorce, and definitely when people got more involved, there was there was this thought that I should try. Um, but I think more of that, honestly, in my circumstance, was uh, was one my own drive to not disappoint myself and everyone else, and to prove that what I had put so much effort and time into was was worth it, right? And two, honestly, the it was his his very active and intentional effort to. Um, convince everybody else of who he was. And that made people not think that there was anything wrong. Except for me. There's lots wrong with me. <laughs> right? Like, I wasn't an obedient wife. I wasn't doing the things. Is that scary? Um, Where you can feel the room slowly questioning what you see in front of you and what you're experiencing and how obvious it is for you? I don't... I think now it's scary. I think at the time, I didn't know myself enough to know that I was right to feel what I felt, and it just convinced me to change my mind. Like, oh, then I guess it's me. So... I'm not, I, yeah, I am impulsive, yeah, I am selfish. Like, everything would just come back and, like, I would just re-examine myself and feel like I need to change because look how great he is. Look, everybody sees how great he is. How am I not seeing this, right? And uh, so I don't know if it was scary as much as it was, um, it was just, like, it made me question myself. Like I lost myself is what it was. Yeah. So where does the pain stop and when do, where does the power start? Mm. So, and I think this is how, this is how life works. And this is why I think it's so important to talk about pain to power is that it's never one thing, right? It's small iterations, just like no relationship breaks up over one thing. It's always small pieces that then come together to build on something that then explodes, right? Um, and in the same way, I think my power came in small pieces until I could feel it strong enough to be like, I'm done. Uh, my, my starting point was that I started grad school, and my grad school classes were all focused on equity and excellence in education. And I had always, up until this point, been told by my ex, and just in life, kind of felt like I was mediocre. I wasn't very smart, I wasn't very skilled, there wasn't anything special about me. Um, I just was an average person in life, right? And, um, and at that, not really good at it. Um, and I started grad school classes about race and equity and things that I always knew, but like now had language to understand. And there were small classes with a cohort and they took, um, it was like a two year program. And in that, I found my voice. And I also found that other people resonated and wanted to hear my voice. And that was my starting point of power because I was like, oh, like I have something to say and people want to hear it. And I started to see myself as having worth um, after a long time of not thinking I did. And uh, Take your time. So that was a piece of it. And it just helped me. Like, I mean, that, that snowballed into my entire career. And the path that I've taken is because after those classes finished, um, and mind you, I was doing all that while having children. And so, you know, I had 
three kids at the time, so I was raising three kids and I was taking these grad school classes and I was a full-time teacher and I was still living in this environment of someone who would make me feel like I was always less than, I was never capable, I was never enough. And, um, and, and didn't show kindness and love, like there was just no affection and love. Um, so I did it all, but I did it without a real support system around me. Um, but my colleagues became my support system, my cohort became my support system, and that's what I did, that was my power. My power was that I had community, and that community was able to affirm me and validate me in a way that I had never had before. Um, and then I started teaching those grad classes, so like I was like, oh, I've been asked to teach these classes. Like it was a whole nother level of like, not only like was I successful in the class, but I've been asked to come back and now be like a semi-expert in this and guiding others, right? Um, and it just started to get bigger and bigger and bigger and my responsibilities started to grow. And professionally, I could always find my reprieve through being good at what I did and feeling like I was making an impact somewhere. And that was my power. That was the starting point of my power. And then it was friends and community. And then I think um, <clears throat> the nail in the, the coffin for me <clears throat> was um, about, uh, I guess it must have been uh, 14 years into our marriage. We, <clears throat> his parents were sick and uh, he asked me to move to a very far out place in Virginia from where we live and move in with his, his parents and take care of them. Um, and like, I agree. I really thought I was gonna save my marriage. I thought it was gonna be good for us. I thought it was, I could see all the beautiful things, just like I saw the beautiful family that we were gonna create, right? Like, I, I always have this vision of what can be. Um, I always try to stay positive in things. And I envisioned like a multi-generational home where grandparents were with kids and how beautiful, like how many opportunities there were. And where we moved, and this is important because it goes back to the power question, was very isolating. And I didn't realize it until later, but it was like we were so far that all the friends and all that community and all that support system I had was gone because it, I was so far away. I couldn't, like, it wasn't as easy to drive, like, an hour and a half to come visit me and spend time with me on a Friday evening as it was when I was, like, 20 minutes away from friends. Um, so my support system started to go away, and I um, felt really isolated. My children were going through a lot, and, um, and then on top of it, he had quit his job. Like, he just came home one day and said, I quit and it was a unilateral decision. So like these were things, like I was starting to see, I was like, what? a lot of things happening. Um, and then after many years of supporting him, even though he wasn't working, and supporting him emotionally, and which we know as a man not working, like I, I knew there's a stigma with that. There's a lot of things, right? Like again, I'm always processing what others need around me. And, um, and I tried to be really patient. And, uh, and then I got pregnant with my fourth kid. And I was pregnant, commuting, almost like an hour and a half, one way, every day, while being insanely nauseous and throwing up and like miserable. And, um, and, and I had to get a new job. So he had no job and I had gone out and had to get a new job because we were in a new area and I was trying to get a job there and then I got a job in my district and like but I like I had to keep fighting to keep moving things forward um, but I felt like I was always fighting alone when he had no job did he at least take up the duties of taking care of the kids or helping out or no so it's an interesting thing. I think in his mind, he thought he was a stay-at-home dad. Mm -hmm. But his stay-at-home roles were simply really just that I think he volunteered at their school when he could. He went to, it was what he wanted to do. So he didn't cook, he didn't clean, he didn't even do homework with the children. Like, 
he did take them to activities because he could and I was like an hour and a half away but um, he didn't do homework so I would like work all day and I would come home and I have to do homework now with my kids because no one's done homework with them and no adult in the house out of all the three adults living in the house did homework right like no one is helping to make sure my children are okay and um, emotionally supporting them. Um, he wasn't even helping them with homework. He he wasn't. Um, and we lived with his parents, so his mother was cooking. Um, and then, you know, I go from being pregnant to now having the child, and it was beautiful and it was wonderful because she's a girl. And, you know, I finally had a girl. I have three boys, and that's my daughter, my, my only daughter, right? Um, but I was nursing, and I don't know how much you know about nursing or anybody knows about nursing, but nursing is a complicated thing because like when you're working in nursing, you have to pump and you have to like save this breast milk and make sure that your child has the breast milk when you're not there. And breast milk is like liquid gold. <laughs> like, like you have to be so careful with it, right? You have to take care of it. Now I've nursed with all of my children, so it's not a new thing, but things that would like start to really grade me and upset me would be like, I would come home and I literally was nursing to the point where in a brand new job where it was already very stressful and difficult because I went from having like almost like a different career to some extent in the same field but I went from being a classroom teacher only working with students to now facilitating learning with adults on a daily basis and creating that learning and like it was a lot and, I, and it was new and I didn't know my job very well at all and so I was always overwhelmed by that. Um, but I was, in addition, like nursing, so I would pump. So I would leave the office to go and find a room to pump, and then I would pump on my drive. I know that's very unsafe, but I did it. And I would that pump was back on in my the drive. When it was less popular. And that was when, uh, when nursing was less, well, when you said what was less popular? Like publicly, like folks who have the pump people judging them. I know that's been a thing that I've been seeing on social media a lot of people uh, talking about now. Well, luckily I was in a I was in an office where I think people didn't. Um, mm -hmm. you know, but and I it, I pumped only because I wasn't present with her, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so I don't think that was as much the thing. It was more of like the effort and the time and like, you know, doing it while I was driving to ensure yeah. I had what I needed for my daughter and I would and then I would come home and all the milk that I had pumped would be like sitting out. You have to like refrigerate it. Like it would just would be bottles, just like nothing. And he'd be sitting on the couch in the same position in the same place exactly where I left him um, with my daughter. And it was just a lot of that. It was a lot of that. And then um, I think my moment was, uh, it was, there was a bunch of them. Um, his escalation of aggressiveness towards my oldest son um, had taken a really bad turn. That he kept um, trying to placate me and say, this is, this is how sons and, and fathers have relationships. And I would ask my guy friends, and they're like, no, it's not. No, that's not what a grown man is supposed to do when they get upset with a boy, because he's still a boy. Right, um, and that started to trigger me and make me question things about him. And then, really, it was that we got into an argument—a very similar argument—where he was calling me names, where he was saying things about me, where he was um, treating me just with with. He was just unkind. He was unkind. He was he was demeaning, and I was holding my daughter. And I looked at my daughter and I was like, I, I can't do this. Like I can't have, I, I've already watched my three boys watch this as normal, as love, as marriage, as what relationships are supposed to be. And this has been their narrative of what it is. I cannot do this to another child and not a girl because if I do this to her, if she sees this, and she thinks that this is what marriage is, that this is what a man is supposed to do and how a man is supposed to treat his wife, that's what she's gonna end up with. She's gonna believe that. And that was the moment when I really started to disconnect emotionally. And I got my power. And then there were a 
multitude of things that happened, including one of which uh, a cultural disrespect towards my extended family in Bangladesh. Um, that then on my 40th birthday, or after my 40th birthday, um, <clears throat> there was some reorganization in our, in our offices and I was worried about my job, but then I found out that my job was okay. The moment I found out my job was okay, I came downstairs <clears throat> and I said to him, and I said, I got good news and bad news. Good news is my job is secure and I'm gonna be okay. The bad news is I'm leaving you. I'm done. Can't do it anymore. And that was the start of my power before chapter three, and chapter three was a whole nother other stuff. <laughs> I'll just let you brush for a little bit. I realize I brushed it with the wrong one just now. You said what? I think I brushed I brushed it with the wrong one. I brushed it with the up uh, the the bottom cleaner, not the top cleaner. I mean, you're fine. You can use that brush on the whole shoe. It's not just the bottom. Oh, but okay. I know the bristles are harder, so it's really good for bottom of shoes when it comes yeah, to getting things out. Yeah, and that makes sense. Yeah. One of the folks who did this interview that came out this week was like, this is an ASMR shoe. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> I know. Oh. And he was like, I never realized that, but now that it's in front of me, I can't stop looking at it because of the sound. And I said, that's, that's, that's the it. gist. Oh, I love that. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. And shoe cleaning, that's mm -hmm. ASMR, okay. Everyone loves a good distraction. Yeah, sometimes, and sometimes it's very hard to stay focused with distraction. Like, I'm not great with, like, I, if we, I was, like, drawing mm -hmm. and doing this, it would be different, but, like, you have me doing something outside my comfort zone, so it's, like, it's, it's, it's harder to concentrate because I'm, like, trying to make sure I'm doing this right while, while having You're the fine. conversation. I'm hoping I haven't just ruined my shoes at this point. No, I think you've done a great job. <laughs> oh, and also, it that. gives you a good center for when the hard parts of the story comes. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It does. Do you want chapter four? Um, not yet. Just wanted to give a moment to unpack that, give it a little break. Because going back to those moments, I don't think would just be easy peasy. No. Um, and I wish I could say they're in the past. <laughs> uh, but I have spent the last six years of being separated and divorced still dealing with the reality of what it is to have married and had children with someone who is so emotionally incapable of true self-reflection and healing. So you asked me about my pain to power thing and a lot of it for me is that my ex had gone through things in his life, right? He'd experienced more things than me for certain. Like I had a pretty good childhood upbringing. Um, but I think what he chose is to sit in the pain and then fester it and allow it to make the reason of why he could treat everyone else the way he treated it because he just wanted always sympathy for his pain rather than growth from it. So part of my goal of pain to power is that power, going from pain to trying to find our power and heal is a choice. And not everybody makes that choice because it's not easy. And some people just don't want to. Um, so for me, the reason I elevate it so much is because I am, I have a lot of respect for people who choose it, who choose to heal, because then they're doing less harm to the people around them, and the people who don't choose to heal will keep harming the people around them and themselves. What role would you say empathy plays into your experience that you've described? Well, 
vợ That's interesting because there's so many ways to think about that, right? <laughs> like I think um, there's the empathy that I had for him that allowed me to let him get away with a lot of behaviors of the way he responded and treated me, how he acted in our family dynamics, how I saw him do things with my children. And that kind of empathy I, after leaving him, I realized was really dangerous. I'm thinking, right? like, like there's a balance, like empathy is almost on a spectrum, right? Like, um, but I think that in this experience of what I've gone through, I have increased my empathy of just understanding people's stories. Like, I think that's what it is. Like, I think it's just knowing and understanding that everybody has gone through things and that impacts the way they interact with you. And now for him and his circumstances, he chose to do all the things he did to me. But I don't think most people that I interact with whom I've had a bad interaction with or who, um, who say something to trigger me or whatever, right? Like, they do it intentionally. I think there's a lot of people who just, they've gone through things. And that impacts their lens, that impacts how they treat people, that impacts how they process things, that impacts their, the presence of their ego and insecurities. And my empathy is constantly very heightened because I have to recognize, like, what's your story before I judge you or question anything about you? And how do I learn that story better to get a better sense before I make any assumptions? So, and I do think my experience of what I've gone through has helped me to do that. Is there, is there a burden that comes with having that much awareness? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not a massive, massive burden maybe in the realm of all the things in life, but yeah, I think um, you take on a lot of people's energy sometimes, right? Like I can, I can feel, um, exhausted leaving conversations at times or um, or in like just even being in a space with someone who has a lot of heavy things right um, so there's that like that feeling of like having my I have to take care of myself. Like, you know, the, the idea of like, you have to put your oxygen max on first. So I think that it's hard when you have so much empathy and when people are so empathetic. And I wouldn't say I'm like a massively, I, I'm an empathetic person, but I wouldn't say I'm an empath because I also have the ability, very differently from some people I know, to shut things down very quickly. I have a on off switch. Um, and that's a protection thing, absolutely, over time in life. Right, um, but uh, you like when you have empathy for others, it helps you to understand people. But it also, yeah, it's just heavy. It's heavy, and sometimes it's exhausting because you have to have empathy for I don't know, like just be frank, like some idiots, right? <laughs> like some people who like. You didn't do the work, but I got to handle and deal with the fact that you didn't do the work or you haven't figured your stuff out, right? Um, and I have to keep my cool. I have to stay centered. Like, it's just the burden of, like, I got to always be the strong one. I always be the one who has composure, like, and it gets exhausting. So chapter four, I'm leaving you. <laughs> chapter four. So six months, I was able to walk away from the marriage. It took me six months. I, uh, it was me and the four children, and uh, we moved. 
closer to family, closer to friends, closer to work. Um, and I started this new life. And I think for chapter four, I was really confident because by the time I finally left him, like I knew I was done with him. So there wasn't like, it's my on off switch, right? Like my, I was off, I was done. I got no there's, no, there's no feeling of love lost here. There's no sadness. There's no like regret. There's like, nope, this is the decision to make. This is the time to make it. And, um, and everything is pointing to this direction. But what I didn't take into consideration was that when you are married and you have children and you leave a marriage, you are not just holding on to you and your, your emotional things. You are responsible for a lot of people's emotional things. And I was the more, I have always been, to be honest, the more mature and stable and self-aware adult in my children's lives. Um, so that was hard, but it was also one where at that time I think I didn't realize that even though all of us were living in the same home and experiencing the same things, we weren't seeing it the same way. And my children felt like I took them from a happy home. And they were told I took them from a happy home. And they were told that I broke up their home and they were told that I didn't care about their father's depression or their father's sadness or their father's feelings and I was, I was mean and I was selfish. They were told many, many things about me. And um, it was a really hard chapter has been a different kind of pain because I've had to constantly be on guard with my emotional safety and mental health with my own kids for a while. And not because they're bad people, but because they have had their own hurts and they didn't process it and they haven't all processed it. And those have come out to hurt me. And truthfully, there was someone who was intentionally creating a divide between me and my children. And so chapter four has been hard in that respect, but chapter four was also where I got my voice, and my, my language. It was when I realized that I had been hurt so badly. It was when I started to put words to it, like, oh, emotional abuse is what this was. Oh, manipulation. Oh my God, I think he's a narcissist, right? Like all the language, because I could see the behaviors that I was reading about or hearing about that were very much the things that I was experiencing and had experienced. And, um, and because of that, I, um, I found my power even in my pain. I cultivated in chaos. So I kept growing almost in like this small little pocket of space because I couldn't grow fully with my kids. Um, so I just kept growing on my own and, um, and being there with my children. Like I still supported them, I showed up for them, I did the things, I, you know, I, I was there in all the things that I could be. Um, but it was always fighting the current. It still is fighting the current <laughs> because uh, I don't think my happiness and a healthy relationship with my children is really what he wants ever. It threatens him. Um, and when something threatens someone who has an ego and is narcissistic, they want to eliminate it or poison it or, or break it apart. So 
But chapter four is also when I started writing and I started processing a lot of this. A lot of it was my kids. It was the pain of like not knowing myself. Like I came out of this marriage and I'm like, I don't even know what I like or don't like. Like I didn't know myself. And then, and then it was um, like, it was love like you know I was processing this stuff and I tried to start I started dating like I was interested I wanted I wanted something to, to to like heal the pain of what it felt like to be so unloved for so long like I was searching for love um, and so I started writing about it and that was my blog which was called brown girl interrupting all about my writing all about my story like this navigating of culture like I started with right and um, as a brown woman, as a daughter of immigrants, as like culturally straddling being American and being, um, being Pakistani and Bangladeshi um, and Muslim, all of it, and also then being a woman. And then finally, you know, I'm an interrupter, so brown girl interrupting. <laughs> like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a rule follower, I'm a rule, I'm a critical analyzer, as <laughs> her rules. And, uh, and, um, and I started writing a tiny blog and I really thought it was just a healing thing and I sent it to a few friends and made this teeny tiny little website literally like and and um and then I would run into people that I hadn't seen in years and they'd be like oh I really liked your piece on children and healing and your relationship with your kids and I could resonate with them like you read my stuff like I'm like wait what like it was kind of surreal that that people were reading my writing um and not just reading my writing but then they would say to me your writing made sense to me I could understand it and it was like a range of it would be women my age to like one time it was, uh, I had gone to a friend's house and like her 20 year old daughter and her like friends were like, we love your writing. I was like, wait, you love my writing too? And then it would be guys who would come up to me. And I was like, this is just like a lot of people like are hearing it, right? And in that they would share their story. So it would start with me, like kind of the catalyst of my writing, but it would then be them sharing their stories. And what started to happen is I started to learn many, many different pain to power journeys. And a couple more pieces, but then we came to my show, Pain to Power. And, um, and that's, you know, this is kind of the, the, the chapter four, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm on the precipice of chapter five and where this is all going. Um, but chapter four has been three seasons of a show where I elevate other people's stories of pain to power because they choose to heal. And they have beautiful stories of how they have found themselves and now they lead others to, to, to heal, to be better, to find their own grounding, right? Like, and they do it through such you know, beautiful ways, whether it's just by modeling their behavior and giving someone the like almost like the permission to do it, right? Like uh, one time I had um, a, a model on the show and she, was, uh, she decided, she started, she's a plus size model and she started at 42 to become a model. And I mean, that's quite a, that's a huge thing, right? Like that's a big thing, but it's like she gave permission to so many women through her decision to take this leap. And that came from her own journey of figuring things out for herself, of healing things in herself, right? Um, and then there's poets, and there's authors, and there's musicians, and there's educators, and all of it just coming together. And I mean, like you can see, I'm cheesing. I'm cheesing because I really, truly, truly believe in the power of storytelling, which I love that you do too, right? Um, because it heals us. It's cathartic and beautiful to sit here, even though I'm really probably just doing all kinds of craziness with my shoes, but to sit here and process this story of mine that has been my story, so it's not like I didn't know it, but to say it out loud is such a different feeling. And to have someone hear it and want to understand it 
on a deeper level. That's empathy. And that's healing. And it's healing in community. And that's, that's what I believe in, very wholeheartedly. What do you expect of your everyday shoe? My everyday shoe? What do I expect of my shoe? Yeah, just of your shoe. Like, hey, I put you on. You're going to hold me down? Mm. You can't have weak ankles. The sole, it needs to be comfortable. Got to match my socks. Got to match my socks. <laughs> my everyday shoe. Okay, so these are my everyday shoes. Let me be totally honest. Like, I'm not okay. a sneaker wearer. Okay. I love these shoes. Mm -hmm. They're going to be warm and cozy. They're flat. I always wear heels, and this is, like, the only time I wear flats. Um... They do support like my ankle. They support me, right? Like mm -hmm. they, they, they hold me in. They make me feel secure. They can take me really far. My travel shoes for certain. I, it, it's funny, like doesn't matter what the weather is, I will go to a beach traveling in these, right? <laughs> like these are my travel shoes. Like these are my, if you know me, you know I wear the boots with the fur. It's a hilarious joke about me because that is me, the boots with the fur, mm -hmm. because they're just like my go-to, like, and, and honestly, like, okay, this is like a funny thing, but I'm just gonna tell you. Like they're broken and I'm still wearing them. <laughs> Because even being broken, mm -hmm. they provide all those things to me. And I'm okay yeah. with it because they're familiar and they're comfortable. And familiar and comfortable feels really good. So I love putting them on in my everydays. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I like that. <laughs> I've never thought about that. But like that just processing helped me like to think about it so metaphorically. My boots with the fur. Boots with the fur. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say your everyday shoe has taken you where you want to go in life? Absolutely. Yep. Because it takes me outside to sit on my beautiful patio of the home that I've cultivated in the chaos that I cultivated it in where my children all come over and have a space to all be together in the chaos that they've been in. And I get to sit in these great shoes on my patio and take it all in. Um, I've traveled the world in these. I went to Fiji and New Zealand all by myself this year in these shoes. And they took me there. Um, road trips. running around, doing work things. Easy go-to's to take my daughter to the playground or go biking or hang out with her. And that has been the saving sunshine in my life. And I know I said it's been really hard with my kids, but I have to be clear, I have three boys and the boys have been really hard because they were all when I separated my youngest son was 11 no 12. Uh, I had a 12 year old a 16 year old and an 18 year old and those are really hard weird transition ages <laughs> um, and then add all the other things that I described right on um, but my daughter was not even two yet when I separated. And she has been the sunshine and the gift and the healing in my life that honestly, I don't know if I would have gotten through the last six years without her. And these shoes <laughs> helped me to hang out with her. There's a reason I brought it up. There's a full circle, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, they're good shoes. They gotta be, they broke like in April and I still wear them. <laughs> What's one piece of advice you'd give to other mothers that may have been in your shoes? Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> well, as a mother, I would say, it's funny because I was thinking about this today, I was thinking what is my big lesson that I think I've learned in motherhood that I take away and I think about it as really my big spiritual lesson that I've understood in my spiritual journey since I've been separated, or since I separated and now I've been divorced, is let go. Because it is really easy and it is really it's almost like it's your security blanket because life is changing, everything around you is changing, everything feels like at times it's falling apart and what we want to do sometimes is hold on tight, hold on tight to the love of our kids, hold on tight to the, the, the norm of what's going to happen in our lives, hold on tight to the idea of love, like hold on tight to everything and I think the most freeing and peaceful thing that has brought me closer to just being like able to handle all the hard moments is to let go. Let go of controlling things, let go of controlling outcomes, let go of controlling people, and particularly your children. Let them be who they're going to be and let them learn what they're going to learn while just always being their safe space. While just always being the person that is going to love and nurture them and be there for them regardless of what happens, what pains they go through, whatever comes up in life. And it's sometimes hard to do that, I think, because when the world around you is crumbling, you want to hold on to things. You want to hold on to the things that seem like they're solid. And you think your children are your solid thing. You think they're yours. <laughs> um, but they're not. So today my motherhood lesson is, yeah, I let go. Hi, I'm Maria Cosme, also known as Brown Girl Interrupting, the executive producer of Pain to Power, and this is A Day in My Shoes.